Okay, um, unfortunately I can't be in class on Monday to do uh, my review with you, so I'm going to work some problems for you in this video that hopefully will help you prepare for the exam. Uh, it's going to be a quick review, but still going to take a lot of time. It will probably be a long video, um, but it's you can use this video however you want. You can fast forward through parts, skip parts, if you feel like you understand a problem or whatnot. It's just here for you to have examples and a review. So on the first day we talked about thermal expansion and the ideal gas law. And we said if I have some solid and it expands, I heat it up, its length is going to change according to the equation alpha L delta T, where L is the initial length and delta T is the change in temperature and this here is known as the linear expansion coefficient. It's a property of the material. So if I might have some object made of copper and I want to see how it expands, I look up the thermal expansion coefficient for copper. This equation is valid not just for the total size of something, but any in linear dimensions. If you have a ring with a hole in it, use this to find how the diameter of the hole in it expands with temperature. You have a figurine and you want to measure the distance between the two eyeballs, this is the equation you'd use. For area, we had a similar equation, except we had a factor of 2 here for reasons I explained in the video. And for volume, we have something similar but with a factor of 3. And 3 alpha is what we call beta, the volume expansion coefficient. For an ideal gas, we had a different equation. Gases, remember liquids can change their shape. So it doesn't make any sense to talk about the area or length of a liquid because they're going to adjust to fill their container. It only makes sense to talk about the volume change in a liquid. That's why we have a special thermal expansion co coefficient for volume so we can discuss liquids. An ideal gas can also change its volume, right? So we have, for ideal gases, we have the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT, or equivalently PV equals NK Boltzmann T, right? Where N is the number of moles, whereas capital N is the actual number of molecules. Pressure, volume, temperature, ideal gas constant, Boltzmann's constant. Okay, so let's work a problem. This is similar to a problem some of you struggled with on the homework, all right? So finding out how something expands thermally is easily. We just use this equation. But here's a tougher problem that involves that. I measure the height of a glass figurine with a steel ruler and find it to be 10 centimeters when the ruler and the figurine are at a temperature of 25 degrees C. How tall will I measure the figurine to be if the ruler and the figurine are at a temperature of 45 degrees C? All right, so I'm not asking how tall will the figurine be at 45 degrees C. I'm asking what would I measure it to be with the ruler. All right, notice the thermal expansion coefficient for steel is bigger than for glass. So even though the figurine will expand as I heat it up, I'll measure something smaller because my ruler will expand more. Now there's several ways, wrong ways to work this problem. I'm going to show you one right way. Here's the, how I like to think about it. I'm going to have my figurine, right? It's at some length LF. I heat it up, that'll change to some new length, L, LF prime. The new length is the original length plus how much it changed, right? But how much it changed by is just going to be alpha, the thermal expansion coefficient for glass, its initial height times the change in temperature, right? So that's how much the figurine expands by, but I'm measuring it with a ruler. But let's imagine that my ruler is made up of lots of tiny little pieces of ruler, all right? let's say micron sized pieces. So my ruler is made up of these little micron sized slices have a length L, length of one micron sized slice, all right? But each of those slices is going to expand thermally so that after I heat things up, these little slices that used to be one micron thick are now this length, which is going to be their original length plus alpha still L sub mu delta T, all right? What do I measure? Well, initially, I measured how many microns tall it is. The number of microns tall is just how big the, the object is divided by the length of one micron. OK, when I heat things up, I'm going to measure the new length of the thing, but I'm going to measure it with a ruler whose marks, these little micron-sized slices, are also expanded. So this is the number of microns thick, or whatever else of you is I'm going to measure. So what I measure is going to be how many microns times the length, the original length of the micron, right? So I think these slices are still this length, and so I get the wrong measurement. So this is the wrong 
measurement that I make. This is the answer I want for the problem, right? What's the wrong measurement I get for its height using this ruler because I'm assuming the ruler is still calibrated, that those little slices are still one micron thick or whatever you want them to be, all right? Choose whatever length you want them to be. All right, so N prime is LF prime over L mu prime, all right? But LF is this thing up here, right? LF prime is just LF plus alpha glass, LF delta T, um, L mu prime is just L mu plus alpha steel, L mu delta T, and this is all multiplied by L mu. The L mu's cancel out, and then I'm gonna pull out the LF out front, so this measured value is just going to be LF alpha glass delta T, one plus alpha glass delta T divided by one plus alpha steel delta T, all right? So that's one plus alpha glass delta T. If I look at this, if glass expands more than steel, I'll measure something bigger than LF. If steel expands more than glass, which is the actual case, I should measure something actually smaller than the original size of the figurine, even though the figurine got bigger. All right, so now let's pull up Python. Python is just a programming language, and I like to use it as a calculator. So what we want to find is LF, and LF was 10 centimeters, so 10. Oh, do our units work? LF has units of centimeters, and then we want our answer to be centimeters. And this stuff is all unitless, right? The units of my linear expansion coefficients are inverse kelvins. My temperature's in kelvins, right? Temperature changes in kelvin, or equivalently in Celsius, right? This is one time I can use Celsius if I want, because temperature changes are the same in Celsius and kelvin, all right? So this will be unitless and my units work out. So let's go back up here. My object is 10 centimeters. And I'm going to multiply that by 1 plus the thermal expansion of glass was glass was 9 times 10 to the minus 6. And steel was 11 times 10 to the minus 6. And I changed by 20 degrees C. All right? So 1 plus glass was 9 times 10 to the minus 6. All right, and then we want to multiply that by the 20 degrees C that it changed by, right? And then in the denominator, it's going to be 1 plus 20 degrees C times 11 times 10 to the minus 6. And there should be my answer, 9.9996008. So equals 9.9990008. Oh, 6, oh, 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 eight, eight. Did I get that right? 6, oh, 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 eight. Eight. Okay, notice, I didn't plug my, and that's centimeters, right? I did not plug my numbers in until I'd solved everything algebraically. That is really important. You will make much, many fewer mistakes if you work things algebraically and don't plug numbers in at the end. Also, it's easy to check units and look at it and say, well, what if this constant were different? What if I change the temperature more? Do things scale the way I expect them to? If you do things algebraically, you have the opportunity to look at your work and see if it makes sense and maybe catch errors so you don't miss points on your exam. Anyway, let's do a problem with the ideal gas law. A balloon, when it's not inflated, has a mass of 2 grams. I fill the balloon with, to a volume V sub C with air at atmospheric pressure and a temperature of 25 degrees C. I then heat it up to a temperature of 35 degrees C and it just starts to float in the surrounding 25 degrees C air. What is the total mass of air that I put into the balloon to make that happen? All right? Okay, so how are we going to solve this? What we know is we know the mass of the rubber that the balloon's made of, right? We want to find the mass of air that we put into it, right? But what else do we know? We know the initial temperature is 25 degrees C. The final temperature is 35 degrees C. All right, and we know that the pressure in the balloon and in the surrounding atmosphere is always atmospheric pressure, all right? We want it just to float. That means neutral buoyancy, right? That means the buoyant force equals the force due to gravity. So the force due to gravity on the balloon is going to be, well, it's going to be the mass of the rubber of the balloon plus the mass of the air in it times g. That's the force due to gravity. What's the buoyant force? The buoyant force is the volume, or sorry, the, the weight of the displaced air. So the displaced air is going to have a volume, let's call it 
let's see, this, let's call this temperature cold and temperature hot, all right? It's going to be the volume of the balloon when it's hot, because that's when it starts to float, times the density of air, of the surrounding air, times G, right? And that is the buoyant force. And those two have to be equal, right? So we can cancel out the Gs, and then we just get mass of the rubber, I don't need parentheses, mass of the rubber plus the mass of the air in the balloon, which is what we're trying to find, is equal to the volume of the balloon when it's hot times the density of the cold air surrounding the balloon, which is the same as the density of the air in the balloon before we heat the balloon up, right? It's just the density of air at 25 degrees C, right? Okay, so how do I find the density of the air? Well, density is just mass per unit volume, all right? So for example, when my balloon is cold, the density of the cold air in the balloon is going to be the mass of the air I put into the balloon divided by the volume of the balloon when it's cold. The density of the hot air in the balloon is going to be equal to the mass of air in the balloon divided by the volume when it's hot. Well, the density of the air in the balloon when it's cold is the same as the density of the surrounding air, right? Because they're at the same pressure and same temperature. PV is equal to nRT, right? So for a given volume of air, if the pressure and temperature is the same, I have the same number in there, right? So I have the same mass. So the density of the air in the balloon when the balloon is cold is the same as the density of the cold air surrounding the balloon. So the density of the air right there, that's just going to be the mass of the air in the balloon divided by its volume when it's cold. So basically, the equation we have is that the mass of the rubber plus the mass of the air is equal to the mass of the air times the volume when the balloon's hot divided by the volume when it's cold. So I know the mass of the rubber. I want to find this. If I knew the ratio of those two volumes, I could solve this problem. How do I find the ratio of the two volumes? Well, the ideal gas law, right? PV is equal to nRT. When I heat it up and change its temperature to change the volume, the pressure doesn't change, right? Because we said it's staying at atmospheric pressure. The balloon just expands. The number of moles of gas inside the balloon don't change either. So if I apply the ideal gas law when the balloon's cold, I have atmospheric pressure times the volume of the balloon when it's cold is equal to nR, the temperature when it's cold, where here's the number of moles of gas that I put in. If I knew that and I knew the molar mass, I could find the mass of the stuff that I put into the balloon, which is what I'm trying to find. But I don't know that, right? Because I didn't tell you what the volume was cold. But I do know that when the balloon's hot, this will still be true, except for it'll be hot. So I'll still have atmospheric pressure. It'll be a bigger volume because we heated it up, but it'll be the same number of moles. R is a constant, and then I have temperature hot. All right. What I want to know is volume hot divided by volume cold. Now, since this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, this divided by this ought to equal this divided by this. So I can take the ratio of these and find V hot over V cold. If I take this divided by this, the pressure cancels out, and I get V hot divided by V cold. And that's equal to, then, this divided by this. The N and the R cancel out, and I get T hot over T cold. So I can plug that in here. This is all equal to M, the mass of the air, times T hot over T cold. All right? Now we can solve this for the mass of the air. MR equals, let's take this over here, and we're going to get the mass of the air times this minus the mass of the air. So this is just mass of the air T hot minus divided by T cold minus 1. Ah, so the mass of the air is just going to be the mass of the rubber divided by T hot over T cold minus 1. And that's equal to, we plug in the numbers now, we said that the balloon has a mass of 2 grams. So 2 grams, we'll do this in grams. What about units? Do units work out? The, the denominator is unitless, the top has units of mass, so we're good. And I can leave it as grams. I don't have to convert it to SI units because, um, yeah, we just want our answer. We can get our answer in grams and everything else cancels out. So I'm going to say 2 grams times the mass. So that's the mass of the rubber. It's going to be 2 grams divided by the ratio of the temperatures. What are the temperatures? So T hot is 35 degrees. 35, but it's 35 degrees C. I need this in Kelvin, right? Unless it's a temperature difference, I need Kelvin. So 273.15, I add to that. And then I'm going to divide by T cold, which is 25 degrees C plus 273.15 to convert it to Kelvin. All right? And I like an abundance of parentheses to make sure I'm doing things right. 
So I have the ratio of the temperatures, and then I have to subtract 1. And I divide that whole thing, and I find 59.6 grams. Whoops. 59.6 grams. And that's my answer. That's how much air I have to put into my balloon if I want it to um, float when I heat it up to 35 degrees. Now, chances are your balloon will pop if you put that much in. Not a realistic problem. Right? But you can try it at home. Right, the next homework, we talked about heat capacity and latent heat. We said heat capacity relates how much heat you have to put into something, how much thermal energy you have to put into something to change its temperature. And we said, this is the equation. The heat that you have to put in is the heat capacity times the change in temperature that occurs. All right, we said the heat capacity is specific for any given object. So we like to divide it by mass to find kind of the heat capacity per unit mass for a particular material. So if I had a piece of copper, I could find its heat capacity by taking the specific heat, little c, which is the heat capacity per unit mass. And I can look that up for copper, and I can say, well, if I had a piece of copper, its heat capacity is just its specific heat times the mass. That's a little c, that's a big c, all right? Or q is equal to the mass times the specific heat times delta t. These two are equivalent, right? But this is something I can look up in a table, right? It's copper, whatever. Whereas this is specific for a particular piece of copper of a certain size, all right? Then we talked about the latent heat. The latent heat is the amount of heat that has to flow in to melt something, to change the phase of something, to take ice and turn it into water, or to make water at 100 degrees C and turn it into steam, all right? And we said that the heat that has to flow in is the mass of the stuff whose phase is changing times this thing called the latent heat L. And we looked that up in a table. It depends on what material it is and what phase change it's doing. So the latent heat for water, or ice turning into water, known as the latent heat of fusion, is different than the latent heat for 100 degree water turning to steam, which is known as the latent heat of vaporization. And then we talked about calorimetry. And the idea with calorimetry is we put a bunch of stuff together, and we find out how much heat flows into each of them each of these objects, and by conservation of energy, they all need to add up to zero. So let's do a calorimetry problem. I put 100 grams of ice at a temperature of minus 10 degrees C into an insulated clep with 150 grams of water at 25 degrees C. Assuming that no heat enters or leaves the cup, surround, surrounding air, etc., what will the temperature of the ice slash water be, and how much ice will there be there in the cup once the system reaches equilibrium? All right, so how do we set up this problem? Well, it's kind of problematic because we don't know how to set up the problem unless we know something about the answer, right? So I'm going to assume something about the answer. There's four possible choices. One is some ice melts, all ice melts, some water freezes, and all water freezes. Now there's also really one other case, which is no ice melts, no water freezes. Maybe things are tuned just right so that when they get to the same, you know, get, anyway, so, so that nothing changes, just the temperatures. Not, we end up with the ice and the water at zero degrees C in the end. But those are really degenerate cases of these other two, all right? So if we choose one, we'll get the answer. We don't need to worry about that fifth case. All right, so what we do is we pick one of these cases, check it out, and see if it works. If I assume that some ice melts, then I know right away that the final temperature is zero degrees C. Because if only some ice melts, when I'm done at the end in equilibrium, I have ice and water left. And ice and water can only be in equilibrium at zero degrees C, all right? So if I choose this one, I will assume that the water is at zero degrees C in the end. And I'll find out how much ice melts. If the amount of ice that melts is somewhere between zero and the amount of ice I started with, I chose right and I'm done. If I find that the amount of ice that melts is more than the ice I started with, then I know that all the ice melted and I need to try this scenario, right? If I find that it's negative, then I'm realizing ice didn't melt, water froze, so I'll try one of these two, right? If I assume that all of the ice melts, right? Then I'm assuming that all the ice melts, I'm left with no ice at the end. But that means if I have no ice left, the temperature needs to be somewhere between 0 and 100 degrees C. 
If I make this assumption and the temperature comes out to be less than zero degrees C, all right, then I know that all the ice didn't melt. But maybe I need to come over to the some ice melts or some water freezes, try one of the other cases, and so forth. If I assume some of the water freezes, that means at the end I have ice and water in equilibrium. The final temperature is zero degrees C. I solve it with that assumption. I find how much water freezes. If the amount that froze is between zero and the mass of water I started with, I got the right answer, or I did, unless I made some other mistake, all right? But if not, then that's not what happened. I need to try one of the other cases, right? All the water freezes. If all of the water freezes, I'm assuming then that the, you know, I know how much water freezes. I need to find the final temperature. That final temperature better be zero degrees Celsius or lower, or else all the water didn't freeze. All right, so we pick one and we try. And I'll just randomly try one. Let's say all of the ice melts. So let's assume all ice melts, just for starters, right? Is it a good guess? Probably not, all right? And you can make some, you can make some guesses, right? So I've got a little less ice than water. It takes a lot of latent heat to melt the ice. And, uh, but there's a little more water than ice, and ice ha water has a bigger heat capacity, so maybe all the ice melts, maybe some of the ice melts. Let's just try this one, just to see what happens. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find out how much heat flows into the ice. If all of the ice melts, it happens uh, in three steps, all right? If all of the ice melts, the final temperature will be zero degrees C or higher, all right? So I'm gonna start with some ice. The first thing I have to do to this ice is put heat into it to get it up to zero degrees C so it can melt. How much heat flows in? Mass of the ice, specific heat of the ice, times the change in temperature, which is zero degrees C minus the initial temperature of the ice. Now I've got the ice at zero degrees C. What do I do? I put in enough heat to melt all of the ice, all right? Then, once I have all of the ice melted, I have to heat the water that used to be ice up to the final temperature. So that's going to be mass of the ice, but now it's water, so we're going to use the specific heat of water. We're going to go up to the final temperature from zero degrees C, which is where we were before we started this step. For the water, it's simpler, right? We just have some water with a specific heat of water, and we are going to cool it down to the final temperature, all right? Now, notice, I don't put a minus sign here. It's always, this is the heat that flows in for this temperature change, but the temperature change will be negative, so negative heat will flow into the water, such that when I add these two together, I should get zero, right? So then what I do is I just add them together. I take this plus this and set it equal to zero. Mass I, C, ice, zero degrees C, minus T, ice, plus mass ice, L, plus mass I, C, water, T, final, minus zero degrees C, plus this thing, plus mass water, C water, T final, minus the initial temperature of the water, and all that has to equal zero, right? I'm gonna stop at this point, because now it's just algebra. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the final temperature. If we do everything right, and we find the final temperature to be somewhere between zero degrees and 100 degrees C, then we chose the right approach, right? We, we were right in assuming that all the ice melts, and we're done. If I find that the temperature is below zero degrees C, then I'm gonna say, oh, I took too much heat out of the water trying to melt the ice. It just, yeah, didn't work. So then I could try maybe some of the ice melts or some of the water freezes. I'll, I could try a different one, right? What if I had shows, what if I assumed some of the water freezes? What would happen there? Some water freezes. All right? So if some water freezes, once again, I'm going to know, okay, if some water freezes, I'm going to know that the final temperature is going to be zero degrees C, right? Because I have some water and some ice left over in equilibrium. So the amount of heat that flows into the ice if some water freezes then is I just have to take my ice and I heat it up to zero degrees C. All right, so that's how much heat flows into the ice. All right, how much heat flows into the water? if some water is freezing. Well, we have to take the mass of the water and we have to get it down to zero degrees C first. All right? So this will be a negative number because, the, sorry, the temperature of the water. The initial temperature of the water is positive, so heat will flow out of the water to cool it down to zero degrees C. So I'll get a negative number here. Then, remember, Q, just to keep things straight, I like Q to always be the amount of heat that flows in. 
So how much heat, now I've got my water at zero degrees C, how much heat flows in while I freeze some of the water? Well, a negative amount of heat will flow into the water. Negative delta ML, where delta M is how much water freezes, all right? Add those two together, and it should be equal to zero, right? Now what are we solving for? The mass of the water that froze. If we find that the mass of the water that froze is somewhere between zero and the total mass of the water, we made the right choice, assuming we didn't make any other mistakes, and we're done. If we find that the mass of the water that froze is negative, that means water didn't freeze, ice melted. If we find that it's greater than the mass we started with, then all of the water must have froze, and we do that scenario. And that's as far as I'm going to take that one. Let's talk now about the first law and, and conduction. The first law of thermodynamics is basically just uh, conservation of energy. There is some thermal energy inside of our gas, right? Due to, yeah, just random energy being spread around. So we've got this thermal internal energy. The change in that energy has to be equal to the things we do to put energy into the system. The work we do on it plus the heat that flows in. Now, by convention, if you have an older book, these conventions might not be the same in your book, but the, the current book assumes that positive work means work is being done on the gas, which means negative work is being done on the environment. Positive Q means heat flowing into the gas. Negative Q means heat flowing out. All right, how do we calculate the work? The work, it turned out, was just minus the integral of P dV from V initial to V final, right? And to do this integral, we needed to know how P changed as a function of volume. We said if we plot a gas on a PV diagram where, um, sorry, we do pressure on this axis, volume on this axis. If I do some process where my gas goes from here to here, the work done is just the area underneath that curve, right? The other thing we talked about was thermal conduction. And thermal conduction tells us about the power that flows through something because the ends of it, different sides of it are at different temperatures. Now the P in this equation is not the pressure because we're not talking about gases now, we're talking about heat flowing through solids. And the power, the rate of energy traveling through the solid is equal to the thermal conductivity of the material, right? It's a property of whatever material your thing's made of, copper, steel, aluminum, whatever, times the cross-sectional area, times the difference in temperature between the two ends. So this is not difference between initial and final temperature. This is the temperature difference between the temperature of the hot side and the cold side, and that's all divided by L. This equation is valid when you are in steady state, meaning temperatures aren't changing anymore. So if I take a piece of aluminum and I stick one side in boiling water and one side in ice water, initially the whole thing will be at room temperature. We're not at steady state. But as time goes by, we'll approach steady state where there's constant power flowing through the thing, and that's when this equation is useful, once we reach steady state. All right, so let's do a problem with the first law. A balloon is filled with, to a volume of 0 0.01 cubic meters with air at a temperature of 25 degrees C at atmospheric pressure. I then heat it up to 35 degrees C. How much work is done on the balloon by the air surrounding it, and how much heat flows into the balloon? Okay, so we're assuming this is uh, an isobaric process, right? Balloons stretch. They don't let the pressure inside increase too much. So we'll assume that uh, the pressure stays at atmospheric pressure as it heats up. So we know the initial volume, the initial temperature, and the final temperature, and we want to know how much work is done and how much heat flows into the balloon. All right? So we've got the volume and the temperature and the pressure, all right? So what we know is the initial temperature, the initial volume, the final temperature. Uh, we know the pressure is always atmospheric pressure, and we want to find um, work and heat. The work done on the balloon and the heat that flows into the balloon as it expands, all right? Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I know that work is the integral, minus the integral of P dV from V initial to V final, right? But the pressure is constant. It's just going to be P naught. So this comes out of the integral, and then it's just going to be the integral of dV, which is V. So it's just going to be V final minus V initial, all right? We're given V initial, right? We need to find, we need to find V final then to find the work, all right? So how do I find V final? Well, I know temperatures and pressure is probably the ideal gas law, right? P initial, V initial is equal to NRT initial. And 
P final, V final, is equal to N R T final, but our initial and final pressures are the same. The initial and final number of molecules in our gas, number of moles of molecules is the same. So I can divide these two and get rid of that junk. So let's just take this divided by this and set it equal to this divided by this, and we get V final over V initial is equal to T final over T initial. Ah, so V final is just going to be V initial times T final over T initial. I can plug that in here now. So this is going to be minus P naught. The V final is just V initial, T final over T initial, minus V initial, which of course is equal to P naught V initial times 1 minus T final over T initial. Yeah, there's my work. Did do that right? Well, let's check it. Does it have the right units? I know from my discussion of PV diagrams and the area under the curve that pressure times volume is, is work. It's energy. And this is unitless, so we're good. All right, so this is T final, this is T initial here. All right, does it make sense? If, if I heat up my balloon so that T final is bigger than T initial, I'm going to subtract something bigger than 1, which means my work will be negative. Does that make sense? Yes, if my balloon is expanding, it's doing positive work on the environment, which means negative work being done on the balloon. All right, so I can plug my stuff in. I'm not actually going to do it. Remember, be careful. These temperatures are given in Celsius. You need them in Kelvin or this won't work, all right? But there's the work done. Okay, but I also wanted to know the heat that flows in. How do I find the heat that flows in? Second law of thermodynamics. So in order to do this, uh, if I know the work, right, and I know the change in internal energy, then Q is just going to be the change in internal energy minus the work, all right? Okay. But how do I find the change in internal energy? Well, it turns out in this chapter we hadn't told you that yet. We, we didn't cover degrees of freedom in this chapter, but we know it from a future chapter. So let's go ahead and review that now. We know that the change in internal energy is just N, number of degrees of freedom over 2, R delta T, conveniently written as NCV delta T, even though this is in a constant volume process, doesn't matter, because CV is just F over 2 R. So let's assume that the air is diatomic. That means that F is equal to 5. And we can go ahead and we can say, oh, I, I know my change in internal energy is N 5 halves R. And I know my two temperatures, right? I was given my two temperatures. So it's just going to be T final minus T initial, all right? In Kelvin, well, actually, it's a difference. So, so or degree C will also work here, okay? So that's the change in internal energy, and if I know the change in internal energy, Q is just the change in internal energy minus the work that we already found. So I'm going to leave it at that. And let's talk about thermal conductivity. Imagine I have a rod made of iron with a length L, and it's connected to a rod made of copper with a length of L to make a combined rod of length 2L. I put the copper end in ice water to keep it at 0 degrees C, and I put the iron in, in boiling water to keep it at 100 degrees C. When steady state is reached, what will the temperature in the middle be? So in other words, I have a rod like this. All right, this is length L, this is length L, and let's see. Oh, oh. There we go, computer's back. So we're gonna put the copper end at zero degrees C. So here's the copper piece. And this is going to be at 0 degrees C. This is going to be at 100 degrees C. And this piece was made of um, b -b 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 iron. So I have a copper piece and an iron piece. And I want to know what's the temperature right there in the middle. Let's call it T sub M for T middle. All right? How would I solve this problem? <coughs> well, what I'm going to do is this, is this is a thermal conductivity problem. And my thermal conductivity problem, my equation is, Power is equal to thermal conductivity, cross-sectional area, difference in temperature over L, right? So this will tell me the power. The other thing I know is that in steady state, this point in the middle is not heating up, right? Its temperature is not changing. That must mean that whatever power flows into it must also flow out. So the power flowing through the copper must equal the power flowing through the iron, all right? So the power flowing through the copper I guess if I'm going to call iron Fe, I should call copper Cu. All right? That must equal the power flowing through the iron. All right? Or in other words, the thermal conductivity of copper 
times the cross-sectional area times the temperature difference. What's the temperature difference from here to here? It's just going to be the temperature in the middle minus 0 degrees C, right? All divided by L. That must equal the thermal conductivity of iron times cross-sectional area times the difference in temperature, which is going to be 100 degrees C minus the temperature in the middle divided by L. Now, I didn't say it in the problem, but you need to know this. I should have said clearly that the areas of the two rods are the same. They're the same diameter. That means the areas cross out, cancel out, the L's cancel out, and you've got a simple equation you can solve for the temperature in the middle now. All right, so there's a problem of thermal conductivity. The next thing we talked about was the molecular model. We derived the ideal gas law from conservation of momentum, and we ended up finding that the kinetic energy uh, in a gas is just N times 3 halves RT, all right? And so we found then, then we, then we used, invoked, what we did is we said, well, the reason that it's this is because each degree of freedom, by the assumption of equal a priority, each degree of freedom contributes an amount of N times 1 half RT, which means the total internal energy of a gas is going to be N times the number of degrees of freedom over 2 RT, or therefore the change in internal energy whenever we do anything to a gas is N F over 2 RT, R delta T, and F is the number of degrees of freedom. For a monatomic gas, there's nothing interesting going on inside the gas at reasonable temperatures, so we assume we just worry about the three translational degrees of freedom. So for monatomic, it's equal to three. For diatomic, we said we got two rotational degrees of freedom, and so F is equal to five, right? And then we said, um, yeah, for more complicated gases, it's more, all right? Okay. Then we talked about the molar heat capacity. So instead of thinking in terms of specific heat, the heat capacity per, per kilogram, we're going to think of the heat capacity per mole of gas. All right, And it turns out that the molar heat capacity, right? so we can write this equation, the sort of M specific heat, it's going to be N times the molar heat capacity delta T. But it turns out you get a different molar heat capacity if you do different processes. For example, there's a molar heat capacity for constant volume. And what we did for constant volume is we said, well, look, if the volume doesn't change, there's no work done. You do the integral of PDV over no change in volume, and you get no work. So by the first law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus work. If there's no work, the change in internal energy is just Q. So for constant volume process, there's no work, which means Q is just the change in internal energy, which is equal to N F over 2 R delta T. And we said, oh, C sub V is equal to F over 2 times R. But for a constant pressure process, there is work. The gas does work, which means more heat has to flow in, NCP delta T. So we said for constant pressure, the molar heat capacity is actually bigger, and we decided then that the molar heat capacity constant pressure is constant volume plus R, and we derived that, and everything was happy. So let's do a problem. A rigid gas tank with a volume V contains a gas of hydrogen, diatomic, at a pressure P initial and a temperature T initial. I heat the gas up at constant volume to a temperature T final. How much heat flows into the gas, how much work is done on the gas, and how much does the internal energy of the gas change? Well, to find the heat that flows, I know the change in temperature, right? And the heat that flows in is just N, number of moles, times the molar specific heat. It's a constant volume process, so I use CV delta T. But CV is just number of degrees of freedom over 2 R delta T. And I know the number of degrees of freedom, right? The number of degrees of freedom, since it's a diatomic gas, it's 5. 5 over 2 R. And the change in temperature is just T final minus T initial. Right? So they're plugging in known things. I can find the heat. Ah, but I need to know what N is. I don't know what N is, right? This is a constant. This is a constant. These are givens, right? But I need to know what N is. So how do I find that? Well, I know the volume. I know the pressure and the temperature initially. So PV equals NRT. So N is going to be equal to PV over RT. And I know 
that uh, I have initial pressure and temperature, and the volume is just given. So P initial, the given volume over R, T initial. These are all givens, and I can find N to plug in here. Note, this is a temperature difference. I can use Celsius or Kelvin. This is not a temperature difference. I need to put the temperature in in Kelvin here. All right? So plug that in. Everything's known, and I get Q. But I also wanted to know how much work is done on the gas and how much the internal energy changes. Well, it's a constant volume process, so we're integrating over nothing. So the work is zero, right? A constant volume process, the work is always zero, which means that the change in internal energy is just going to equal, it's Q plus work, but work is zero, so it's Q. So whatever we find for Q, that's what the change in internal energy is. And that's why sometimes we write shorthand NCV delta T for the change in internal energy, even if it's not a constant volume process, because a constant volume process is when there is no work done, and so this heat that we calculate is the change in internal energy. So even if this weren't a constant volume process, we could still write the change in internal energy as NCV delta T. But because it is a constant volume process, this is also equal to Q. Okay? All right. Then we talked about adiabatic processes. So remember, for an adiabatic process, no heat flows in or out of the system. All right? So Q is equal to zero. All right? This is, we're not talking about a free expansion. We're talking about the reversible adiabatic process. And for the reversible adiabatic process, when we talk about entropy, remember, for entropy, we integrate Q over a reversible process. So for a reversible adiabatic process, since Q is zero, the entropy doesn't change. So just so you know, if I ever ask you the heat flowing in an adiabatic process, it's zero. If I ask about the entropy change in an adiabatic process, if it's a reversible adiabatic process, it's zero. If it's a free expansion, it's not. All right, that's something different. The equation, the equation I remember is P V to the gamma is equal to a constant. Or in other words, P initial V initial to the gamma is equal to P final V final to the gamma. There are also equations that relate temperature and volume or volume and temperature or pressure and temperature. I always forget them. I just remember the ideal gas law. So for example, if I had a problem where I wanted to find things in terms of volume and temperature, I would just say, I'm going to take this equation here. I'm going to get rid of pressure by saying PV is equal to NRT. So pressure is equal to NRT over V. So I could plug that in here and get rid of P. And I'll have NRT initial over V initial. The initial to the gamma is equal to NR T final over V final, V final to the gamma. Then those cancel out, and I find, oh, T initial times V initial to the gamma minus 1 is equal to T final, V final to the gamma minus 1, and so forth. So all those different relationships I can get from this and the ideal gas law. If you want to write them all down on your sheet, go into the test just to speed things up and make sure you don't make mistakes, that's fine. But I never remember them because I can, I can always get them. Okay, so let's do a problem. The gasoline vapor in the cylinder of a car engine ignites, raising the temperature of the gas to T initial. The pressure of the gas in the cylinder then pushes the cylinder up, increasing the volume of the gas by a factor of three adiabatically. What's the temperature of the gas after it expands? Well, so we've got a volume that's changing. We know how the volume changes, and we want to know then how the temperature changes. So I want, we have V initial, we have well, we don't know V initial, but we know that V final is equal to 3 V initial, and that's a piece of information. And we know what the initial temperature is. So we need some sort of equation that relates volume to temperature so that we can find the final temperature. Well, the ideal gas law has temperature and volume in it, but it's also got pressure. We don't know pressure. So that's why we don't use the ideal gas law here. All right? But we know that the expansion is adiabatic. Because it's adiabatic, we can use this equation right here. V, P, V, initial V, initial to the gamma is equal to P, final, V, final to the gamma. Right? We know this equation. We can use this one. Well, we could always use the ideal gas law. It just didn't, we just didn't have all the information we needed. So we're going to use this one instead. But still, this one's, I didn't write down all the formulas for the different variations for an adiabatic egg gas expansion. So I'm going to start with this one and say, I don't want this in terms of pressure. I want it in terms of temperature. Is that the one I just did? Yeah, temperature and volume. We already did that one. So what I found was temperature initial, volume initial to the gamma minus 1. Is that right? Yeah. 
is equal to temperature final V final to the gamma minus one. And so I say, oh, well T final is just going to be equal to T initial times V initial over V final to the gamma minus one, right? So there we go. So it's gonna be T initial times one third to the gamma minus one, right? Because V final is three times the initial. All right, but then what's gamma? And I didn't tell you whether it was uh, diatomic or monatomic or whatever, but gamma is just going to be CP over CV, which is basically the number of degrees of freedom plus two over the number of degrees of freedom. And then you got it. All right. So if I were doing this on a test, I would have to have tell, told you whether it's a diatomic or whatnot gas, and I would remember that because I actually work my test problems all the way through before submitting the test, unlike my review here where I kind of threw some problems together and hoped I could work them. All right, the next thing we talked about was thermal statistics, and basically we said what you need to know is that there's a statistical distribution of velocities, internal energies, and such. That I have these gases flying around, they're flying at different velocities, but statistically we can find things like the average velocity, the most probable velocity, and the RMS velocity. And we had this thing we called the thermal distribution of velocities. We had an equation for it in the book. And we basically said it's kind of this thing that you integrate from one velocity to another to find how many atoms there are in that range of velocities. There's n no atoms going at a specific velocity, right? Because there's an infinite number of velocities to choose from. But we can integrate this thing and find the number in between you know, two velocities. We really didn't do that. I just kind of told you about it. And then we said we have these different things. Most probable velocity is just basically the peak of this curve. The average velocity, well, we average all of the atoms. Since this curve is asymmetric, you think, well, the average is going to be over this way a little bit, right? Because there's this long tail out here that pulls the average over. And then the RMS velocity was we, we, didn't, take the, we didn't average the velocity. We took the velocity squared and averaged that and then took the square root of it. So it biased our average out to higher velocity. So the RMS is going to be out here. The average is right here, and the most probable is in here, right? So that's how they go. RMS is useful when what we really care about isn't velocity, but we want to talk about it in terms of velocity. Like if we, what we really care about is kinetic energy that goes as velocity squared, but we want to talk about it in terms of velocity anyway. All right, so how do you calculate the RMS average? Well, here I've got three numbers. What do you do? Well, you square the numbers, so we're going to get 9. And 17 squared is uh, 49. Um, yeah, basic algebra here. My brain is going nuts. So 7 times 7 is 49. Long multiplication. Get this here. 7 times 1 is 7 plus 4, 11. And then 17, right? We add them together. 189. All right, so I'm going to get 9 plus 189, and 5 squared is, negative 5 squared is 25, so we add them all together, and what do we get? All right, we're just going to do this in Python, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to take 3 squared plus 17 squared plus minus, minus 5 squared. All right, and then I'm going to divide by the number. And there's three of them. So that is the average of the value squared. But I don't want the average of them squared. I want the square root of that. So we'll take this whole thing, raise it to the power of 0.5. And there we go. So the RMS then is going to be 10.4. All right, that's the RMS value. And that's the basic idea. That's how you do RMS. You just square everything, add them together, divide by how many they are. That's the average of the squares. Then just take the square root of that. OK, then we talked about heat engines. All right, for a heat engine, we said a heat engine is a thing that takes heat from some hot reservoir at T hot. And that heat, Q hot, comes in. Some of that energy gets converted to work. Some of it gets exhausted as Q cold into our cold reservoir. All right? And we define the efficiency. The efficiency of an engine is basically what fraction of this heat we put in turns into work. So the efficiency is work divided by Q hot. But by conservation of energy, oh, notably, when we talk about gases, positive Q usually means heat flowing into the gas. But for heat engines, Q hot and Q cold are always positive. But Q, well, they're usually positive. But Q cold is positive when heat's flowing out of the gas, just because it's easier to think that way. Normally, we think of positive work as work being done on the gas. 
But for heat engines, positive work is work coming out of the gas, just because it makes more sense in the context, all right? But we know that work, the work, we put in some heat, some of it comes out as work, some of it comes as exhausted as Q cold. So work is just Q hot minus Q cold, right? So we can also write the efficiency as 1 minus Q cold over Q hot. And this makes sense, right? In the limit, as there's no heat being exhausted, it's all turning into work, we get 100% efficiency. Well, we showed that no heat engine can have an efficiency better than the Carnot efficiency, and the Carnot efficiency turned out to be 1 minus, or no heat engine operating between two thermal reservoirs at two temperatures can have an efficiency more than the Carnot efficiency, which is 1 minus T cold minus T hot. We said equivalently, this is equivalent to saying you can't get something down to absolute zero. All right, so here's a problem. Oh, refrigerators. We said if you can run uh, an engine backwards, right, you put work in, sorry, work in to pull some heat out of a cold reservoir and deposit it into a hot reservoir, right? That's a refrigerator. We're putting work in to pull heat from somewhere cold and put it somewhere hotter. All right, that's how a refrigerator works. A heat pump is the same idea, except now instead of trying to cool something down, right, instead of trying to get something cold inside of our hot house, we're trying to get our house warm inside of a cold outside, right? We're pumping heat in from the outside. So we have this thing called the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. It's the thing that we want. So this is the coefficient of performance for cooling. When we're cooling something with a refrigerator, what we want is Q cold. And what we put in to get it is work, all right? A reversible refrigerator will have the Carnot efficiency, all right? So the Carnot efficiency for a refrigerator, well, I can write the coefficient of performance. Work is just, right, work is going to be Q hot minus Q cold, right? Right, because if I take Q hot plus work, let's see, so work yeah, make sure I'm not making mistakes. Work plus Q cold is going to be Q hot, right? And so work is Q hot minus Q cold. Good. All right. And then for a Carnot efficiency, a, a, the coefficient of, per, of performance for the ideal Carnot refrigerator, replace the Qs with the temperatures, right? So no refrigerator can have a coefficient of performance better than this. All right. A heat pump is the same idea. It's basically the same thing, only what we're concerned about is not how much heat I pull out, it's how much heat I put in, right? So the coefficient of performance for heating, it's just Q hot divided by work, or Q hot divided by Q hot minus Q cold. So the Carnot, the best efficiency for a heat pump is going to be T hot divided by T hot minus T cold. Notice, T hot will always be bigger than T cold, right? And in fact, even not for a Carnot, even not for an ideal reversible, Q hot minus Q cold will always be bigger, or always be smaller than Q hot. So the coefficient of performance for a heat pump is always greater than one. Unless you take into account the fact that, you know, heat can flow in through the tubes and things. But for an ideal heat pump, you're getting all of the heat, all of the energy you put in to run the pump ends up as heat in your house, plus you're pulling, pulling heat in from the outside. All right, so let's do a problem here. Let's imagine I have a heat engine. It inputs heat at a rate of 10 watts, and it outputs mechanical work at a rate of 4 watts. What is the efficiency of the engine, and at what rate does it exhaust heat? All right, the efficiency is work divided by Q hot. But I didn't give you Q hot, I give you power hot. But heat is just, power is energy per unit time. So Q is just power times some amount of time. So we could say in one second, how much heat goes in, I just take the power times one second, all right? So Q hot is just the power of heat coming in times some time. The work being, the work done is just the power of work being done times how long we had that work being done, right? So I can just plug that into my equation and this is just gonna be the power of work times tau divided by the power the rate of heat coming in divided by, or times time. Those cancel out, and I say, oh, it inputs, I've got Q, I've got power hot, I've got work, so that's gonna be four watts divided by 10 watts, and the efficiency then is 0.4, or 40% equivalently. All right, so there's the efficiency of my heat engine. 
Now, at what rate does it exhaust heat? Well, um, work is Q hot minus Q cold, right? So that means that Q cold is going to be Q hot. That means that Q cold is equal to Q hot minus work. Well, what is Q hot? Well, what is what is Q cold? That's going to be the power, the, the rate at which heat is exhausted times how long it was exhausted. And that's going to equal power hot times how long minus the power being done as work, right? And so we cancel out the t's and we say, oh, the rate at which it's exhausting heat is just the rate that heat's coming in minus the rate of stuff coming out as work. All right, so there's a heat engine problem for you. All right, now, reversible engine's refrigerator problem. So let's say I have an ideal reversible engine and it's run backwards as a refrigerator to keep a freezer at minus 10 degrees C. Heat leaks into the freezer at a rate of four joules per second, and the refrigerator has to pull that heat out to keep the inside at minus 10 degrees. At what rate does the refrigerator exhaust heat into the 25 degrees C room? So what do I know? I know the temperature, I know the temperature inside the refrigerator, I know the temperature of the room, right? What else do I know? I know the rate of heat that needs to be pulled out. So once again, converting power to heat, we just use a time. So let's just do this for one second. In one second, four joules of heat will be leaking, will have leaked into the freezer and has to be pulled out. So I'm pulling out heat, Q cold. In one second, I have to pull four joules out of the refrigerator, all right? And I need, what I want to find is Q hot, how much heat is exhausted into the room in one second. And then I can divide by one second to find the power, right? The rate of heat being exhausted into the room. All right, so how do I find this? Well, the coefficient of performance for cooling is, what do I want? I want Q cold, and what do I put in? I put in work, but work is Q hot minus Q cold. Right? So if I knew the coefficient of performance, I could find Q cold, right? So I'll just call this, COP is really hard. I'm just going to call it uh, C, Greek letter C, all right? So I can solve this, C times Q hot minus Q cold, and C is just my coefficient of cooling, right? Coefficient of performance. That's going to equal Q cold, right? And I can solve this to find Q hot, Okay, so C Q hot is going to equal um, Q cold times 1 plus C, which means Q hot is equal to Q cold times 1 plus C over C, all right? And then if I divide this by one second, right, I get power, okay? But how do I find the coefficient of performance? Well, the key here is I told you that it is a reversible, I'm running a reversible engine as backwards as my uh, refrigerator. So a reversible, a truly reversible refrigerator or heat engine is one that operates at the Carnot efficiency. It's the very most efficient one. So C is going to be the coefficient of performance for cooling for a Carnot engine. And for Carnot, right, we just replace the Q's with T's and it's going to be T cold divided by T hot minus T cold. So I've given you the temperatures Better put them in in Kelvin, because that's not a difference there, right? So we convert our temperatures to Kelvin, plug them into here, and that gives us our coefficient of performance, which we plug into here, and then we multiply that by four joules per second, and we get a heat, right? Because that's four joules, and then I find what Q hot is, and that's in one second, so I divide by seconds, and I get, um, I get my answer. Should we actually do this? Okay, let's actually do this one. So temperature cold is uh, minus 10 degrees C. So this is going to be minus 10, minus 270, or plus 273.15 Kelvin. I'm going to divide that by temperature hot. Well, the difference, it's the same in Kelvin and in uh, degrees C. So we'll just say the difference is 35 degrees or 35 Kelvin. All right? That cancels. All right? And so that's what C is. All right? So C turns out then to be negative 10 plus 273.15 divided by 35, and we get 7.51. Let's just call that C. Let's call it 
coefficient of performance, all right? So then I just have to take Q cold. What was Q cold? It was four joules in one second times one minus m one plus my coefficient of performance divided by my coefficient of performance. And that says, ah, 4.5. So Q hot is 4.5 joules, 4.53 joules, which means the power beam going out is 4.35 joules per second, or 4.35 watts. All right? Now, stop for a minute. Does this make sense? If the coefficient of, in the limit of an infinite coefficient of performance, that means um, basically I don't have to put any work in, right? It's ideal. And that's what I get. It's, as C goes to infinity, as my coefficient of performance goes to infinity, one doesn't matter, and I get the Q hot is equal to Q cold. Heat comes out of the freezer, goes into the room. I don't have to put any work to get it in. So that makes sense. So my equation seems to make sense. As the coefficient of performance goes to zero, right, if it gets really, really small, then this becomes infinity, and I have to, Q hot's going to be really big compared to Q cold because I have to put lots of work in. So my equation sort of makes sense to me, right? So that's a way to check my errors. Also, the units are right, okay, all right? And if I look at my final answer, the heat that comes out is gonna be a little bit bigger than the heat that comes, the, the heat that exhausts to the room is gonna be a little bit less than the heat, sorry, a little bit more than the heat that comes out of the freezer because I'm adding this work into it, all right? So I check my answer, it seems reasonable, and I put that down on my exam and I get 100%, I'm really happy because I was careful, I worked things algebraically, I checked my answers, made sure they made sense, I checked my units, all right, okay. Next we talked about entropy, and we talked about entropy micro versus macro state. So the micro state is what every particle in the room is doing, and the macro state is kind of the pressure, the volume, the temperature, the kind of the overall result averaging over everything. And we said that entropy is just Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of the number of microstates that could realize that particular macrostate. So if you say I've got a gas with this pressure, volume, and temperature, that's a macrostate. How many different microstates can realize that? If you count them up, you can find the entropy. But doing that involves quantum mechanics stuff or, or such. So we didn't really, we didn't actually use this equation. It just gave you an idea of what entropy was. The problems we worked, we actually used this equation. The change in entropy is equal to the integral of dq reversible over t from your initial to your final state. So I just integrate the heat flowing into something divided by the temperature, uh, and that tells me the um, change in entropy. But for this to work, I need to have temperature in terms of the heat that's flown in, right? So I can actually do this integral. And it has to be a reversible process. What does it mean for something to be reversible? If I played the movie backwards, physics would be satisfied. It could look absurd, but physics is satisfied, right? An irreversible process is one like a free expansion. I open the lid, the gas comes out. If I play the film backwards, I see me closing the lid, and suddenly the gas is all back inside the box again. That doesn't happen, right? So that would be an irreversible process. So how do I calculate the change in entropy if it's a not a reversible process? Well, entropy is only a function of where you are, not how you got there. So what you do is you find some set of reversible processes that take you from point A to point B, calculate the entropy change doing that, and it's the same, all right? And in fact, for an ideal gas, we found like this general formula you could use. The change in ent entropy for an ideal gas, right? You do some process, it's reversible, it's irreversible, whatever. You find some reversible path to get you from point A to point B, and it turns out to always equal NCV times the natural log of T final over T initial plus NR times the natural log of the final volume over the initial volume, right? So for like a uh, free expansion, the temperature doesn't change, and so this term goes away, and it's just NR times the natural log of the ratio of the final and initial volumes, and that tells you the entropy change. It's an irreversible process. That's okay because we derived this equation by finding, well, we didn't actually derive it in class, but it's really cool if you do the derivation. If you do the derivation, you end up finding some generic set of reversible processes that get you from any point A to any point B, and you got the equation. So even though a free expansion is not reversible, I can still use this equation. All right? It's, it's, anyway, there you have it. So entropy. Let's imagine I have 100 grams of water at 100 degrees C, and it's vaporized to make steam. How much does the entropy change in the process? Well, is it a reversible process? 
Well, it could be, right? As far as the water turning to steam is concerned, if this happened in an environment at 100 degrees C, then it's reversible. If it's not, if it's not in a 100 degrees C environment, maybe it's in a furnace at 1,000 degrees C. It doesn't matter, because we can think of a reversible way to get from point A to point B, and that's having this take place in an environment at 100 degrees C, so, right? So we can just go ahead and say, ah, oh, the change in entropy is just the integral from my initial to my final state of dQ reversible over T, all right? But the temperature doesn't change, so that comes out of the integral, and it's just dQ. And this then, we do the integral, and it's just Q, how much heat flows in from my initial to my final state, which of course is mass of the water times the latent heat of vaporization, right? There's Q, that's how much heat flows in during the process. That's simple, that's a change in entropy, all right? What happens as 100 grams of steam condenses to make water. It goes backwards. In this case, heat is flowing out, so you get a negative ml, and you see the entropy goes down. All right? Okay, a gas starts at a volume VA at a pressure PA and a temperature TA, and then heats up at constant volume to a temperature TB. So we start with a gas, we know PV and T. We're going to heat it at a constant volume to temperature B. Ah, that means no work's done. Ah, but that doesn't matter. We're not asking about work, but I just thought I'd point that out. Okay, so after the constant volume, heating at a constant volume, then we're going to allow it to do a free expansion to volume VC. In a free expansion, the temperature doesn't change, but the pressure goes down and the volume goes up. All right? How does the entropy of the gas change from start to finish? Is this reversible? No, it's not. But it doesn't matter, because we've got a generic equation that works, right, that we, you, we come up with by assuming a reversible path between A and B, right? So if we drew this on a PV diagram, right, we start at some point right here, then a constant volume, so here's P and V, a constant volume, we're going to heat it up, and then we're going to do a free expansion, right? And a free expansion, I can't even draw my PV diagram, but the volume's going to go up to some other volume, and the pressure is going to come down, so we go here, but there's not really a path we can draw on the PV diagram. But the point is, entropy doesn't matter how we got there, it's just I take any path from there to there and calculate the entropy and that's the change in entropy, all right? And so we pull out our Swiss Army knife equation that works for all ideal gas processes, which is NCV natural log T final over T initial plus NR natural log V final over V initial. The temperature doesn't change. The natural log of one is zero, so that goes, oh wait, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. The temperature doesn't change for the free expansion, but it does change in the first step, right? So. Temperature final is just the very final temperature, which is TB, right? So N C V, all right, natural log. T final is just going to be TB, right? And T initial is TA plus NR. The final volume after we've done everything is volume C. We started at volume A, and there you have it. Okay, now, once again, I didn't give you enough information. What else do we need to solve this? We need to know N. You can get N because I gave you pressure, volume, and temperature. PV is equal to NRT. That means that N is equal to PV over RT. So that's equal to pressure A, volume A, R temperature A, right? So if I evaluate this at the beginning, N stays the same. So I can plug that in for N. But the thing I didn't tell you was whether it was a monatomic, diatomic gas, and so forth. So See, remember, CV is equal to number of degrees of freedom over 2 times R. That's what we need to plug in there. That's the one last piece of information we need, all right, in order to solve this. Now, if it were just a free expansion, we wouldn't need it, right? But since more is going on in this problem, we need to know what CV is. That's how we'd find it. If this were monatomic gas, F would be 3. If it was diatomic, it would be 5, all right? And there you have it. Thanks for listening.